Joining us today on Superheroes of Science, we're pleased to welcome Kathy Lamb Kaczynski. Kathy is the Executive Director of the Geography Educators Network of Indiana, and they are guests with IUPUI in the Department of Geography. So welcome, Kathy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sarah and Steve. I appreciate it. And just to let folks know that I have been in education for over three decades, in geography education specifically, but also earth science, which is my favorite topic, and uh, human uh, studying human and environmental interaction. And uh, if, in case people don't know, when people think of geography, I'll ask, I know Steve and Sarah are way ahead of the curve, but when I say geography, what do you think of? What are some terms or ideas that come into your See, head? That's what I was going to ask you to define, because mm -hmm. when you say geography, a lot of people don't know at all what that means. Right. And, uh, I'm guessing the first, I mean, first thing has in mind is a map. Yeah, yep. so it's maps. Yeah. yeah. See, and most people still think geography in the United States, this is not a global issue, but in the United States, people think of Lafayette, Indiana home of Purdue University, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, home of IU, PUI, and other places. They don't think, why is Lafayette located where it's located? Mm -hmm. Why is there a Lafayette and a West Lafayette? What are the strategic values uh, historically and today and into the future of the location of Lafayette or West Lafayette? So you look at these kinds of deeper questions and answers, and that's geography. Uh, the study, we say, like to say the study of human systems and physical systems, and within those systems, but then together. For example, the dreaded uh, coronavirus right now, we're all talking about, this is one massive uh, geospatial or geography issue that people have been dealing with for the, the last year, over a year now, and, um, it's not just about gathering the data. Where does the data come from? Who's sick? Where are they located? Uh, what communities, how the communities are handling their resource management, how they're helping their people and taking all of that information and then creating bar graphs, pie charts, maps, uh, other multimedia pieces of uh, messaging that, that tells a story. And so this is a massive geography project, way more than anyone could have anticipated. And also last winter, remember the Australian bushfires. That is also uh, an example of a massive geography problem. We look at where are the fires located? How much uh, terrain or acreage are they, are they taking up? and destroying, what kinds of impact are they having on the natural environment, the physical environment? What kind of impact are they having on the human environment? How are those impacts within those systems and then between those systems being dealt with? And that's geography today. In most of the world, geography is extremely valued as a, a back, a, a major or minor if you decide to go to a university or as a, a way of living. It's taught from elementary school all the way through high school. In Indiana, we're one of the national leaders really in geography education, K-12. We have great standards. They're, they may not be in depth enough sometimes, but then we have a lot of amazing teachers. So, yeah. but, um, and then Indiana is also a national leader in geospatial technologies. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today it, because not only for employment opportunities, but application use for all the technologies and research used for, with the technologies. And um, then we're setting some national trends and people look at it, little old Indiana, but we don't toot our own horn enough. As you guys know, in education, <laughs> I mean, yeah. we're, people are like, Indiana? Well, who's in Indiana? What do they have to offer? Well, we're, we're it right now. One of the it's for geospatial technologies. I'm lucky wow. enough to work with people like you guys and other professionals. And I'm going to do a quick intro and talk about story maps. 
uh, because that's what I was asked to do. And it, it's one tool. Sorry, Steve, go ahead. I was just going to say, it, it, as an intro to that, I want to back up just a hair because I absolutely want, I'd want, I don't want it to get lost. One of the things you just said, uh, because you said it, it tells a story. Mm -hmm. geography is kind of about telling a story because when i stop and think I mean, okay when i was collecting data for like a geog geo geology degree right we we're looking at you know how the moraines of the different uh, glaciers overlapped and i'm like wow you know i never thought of it as well yeah it was geospatial as it was located in each data point it was located somewhere on earth this particular spot but i was telling the story of what happened in that area. And I never thought right. of it that way. Right. And I absolutely love the, the way you put that. It's, it's telling a story because all these scientists are studying things and collecting data points. And we've done things with the GLOBE program together. And each one, first you first use your GPS to figure out where you are in the world. And then you collect that data in those data points and you're telling a story about what happened there. And so I think that is absolutely perfect. And then leading into, as you, as you started to, before I interrupted you there, I started, th fine. that leads into a story map being that visual storytelling right. of the science or whatever I mean, I'm using science generically at this point, but whatever you're researching in a geospatial environment, I love that. Well, and you mentioned um, geospatial technologies in place. So we all know how our cell phones work, right? Or everybody kind of knows how they work. Uh, the same with a, a GPS or a global positioning system. And imagine the earth surrounded, and there's lots of cool images on the internet surrounded by 37 plus satellites. And there's more than that now. And then the European folks are putting up their own set of satellites, though totally dedicated to finding the exact location of something on the planet Earth. And uh, so we, we go out with our device and you're saying, where am I at? Latitude and longitude. So latitude, picture the Earth and the equator. And I should have had, I do have a globe. I think somewhere. As we can see, three of them, four of them, at least. <laughs> well, here's a globe. And the equator is roughly, see, there's the Horn of Africa, kind of roughly comes around like that. And that is zero degrees latitude. And then as you head north and south, south, there are lines of latitude that run across the globe that we geographers or anybody the geospatial technologies use as a reference to find out where your place is on that planet Earth. Then we have also lines of longitude, long stretching from north to south, south to north, and they divide the Earth into those pieces. And wherever we are located on the Earth, let's say we'll do uh, West Lafayette, Indiana, there's a line of latitude and longitude. And they intersect, and that is an exact location of where some, someone or something is. It's easy today because on our phones, where most of us um, have a GPS on the phone, and you can find out your exact latitude and longitude, where you are located, where uh, a particular research project is located, where all of these sick people are located with the COVID. And so then we're creating maps and aggregating or gathering that data because it tells a story. So why now uh, recently, and I hate to keep using this example, but I saw in the paper yesterday, I think several counties in Indiana are now in the blue for the COVID virus. So that uh, means that there are no new escalations in cases uh, for that. So that's a good thing. But how do we know that? Well, somebody is working hard, the doctors, the nurses, the medical people are gathering that data and reporting that data to our state department of health. And then that, that data gets mapped, usually within a 24 hour update. We have a really good uh, person working on our dashboard for Indiana and the COVID virus. So that's kind of a uh, ties into location and place. Imagine if we are looking at all of the schools, say in uh, Madison County, Indiana, which is down along the Ohio River. And 
we've mapped out where all of those schools are located. Each one, each school has a latitude and a longitude where they intersect and they have an exact location. Then we create a map that has all of those uh, schools on the map. And let's say we're worried about flooding at a couple of schools. So then we might create a map, a different map that has bodies of water on it or maybe where we have flooding after a heavy rainfall. Then we're thinking, hmm, what kind of roadways might be affected by the flooding so that we can get the kids in and out of those schools safely if there is flooding. So then we would have another layer, a map that shows the roadways. In the olden days, back, I say when Abraham Lincoln was doing surveying, right? We would have to send someone out to do this field work and gather this information every single time we were doing some sort of research on a project. Now, thank goodness for technology and uh, softwares and research. And under the umbrella, it's called Geographic Information Sciences or Systems, so a GIS. And in a GIS, it's, I look at it as a massive software framework that can gather and pull together billions of points of data which if you think about the earth and the moon and space and Mars and further beyond, there are billions of points of data intersecting latitude and longitude lines and in space, it's three dimensional. You bring in that Z axis. And um, then we have a place in this software package that we can gather data and research so we'll, we can find out the school locations and we can find out the waterways and we can find out the roadways and we can put those pieces together, those various layers of mapping data and create one large map. So we get a better picture with a GIS on how to use data more effectively. And maybe the, the roadway information might not be something that we really need when we're looking at flooding in some schools. Maybe we need other kinds of information. What, what is the land cover? What kinds of industry is in the area? what types of rail lines are in the area. There's so much data and on the GIS because it's a software package, we can turn off layers and turn on layers literally with just a click of your mouse. And so then if we wanna bring in a hundred layers of information from that mapping perspective, then we have created this massive map that can tell a story and help us hopefully to solve a problem and then plan for the future. And geo, this is that larger umbrella of geospatial technologies, but utilizing GIS is how everyone's managing all of this um, data for uh, the COVID virus. And how are we gonna distribute resources? How are we gonna manage information? How do we manage all of those people? And uh, luckily, there are a lot of really smart young folks moving in and some of us older folks, I'm not in that GIS realm. I'm not that proficient, but I know just enough to be dangerous. And I know who to call if I need to have some questions answered, right? And That's then a they modest can- modest statement. Oh, you know how you guys are surrounded. We're all surrounded by amazingly talented people who can take this spatial data and analyze it and try to come up with, um, you know, how to solve a problem. It's amazing in the future. And these are, there's jobs. We have jobs all over the state doing these things. Uh, for instance, the utilities, you think about where all just your, your poles are located that are holding your power lines and your cable lines. That's the tip of the iceberg for the utilities for using a GIS. How can we more effectively put in transformers or when you're building a new neighborhood, how can you lay that out more effectively? That's mapping and using all of these place location pieces of information. And with this snowstorm we just got, right? Yeah. The last week and a half, we've gotten a lot of snow and very frigid cold temperatures. And how are we managing our um, the vehicles that go and help treat or plow? How do we use all the sources, the city employees and the state employees and the local people but then also all of our volu 
volunteer uh, plowing equipment. How can we best utilize those folks and where to send them? And, and they're following a map. They're, they're assigned a targeted area and following maps. So again, there's more stories. I, um, I also like a year ago, I mentioned the Australian bushfires and that was very sad. Not only were where they're located, but how they impacted the local environment. And everybody of course loves koala bears and that became the issue. And it was horrific seeing those videos. But how was that going to for, uh, impact the koala bear population and growth in the next 10, 15, 20 years? How long will recovery happen of their natural habitat, of their populations? Uh, there'll be some regions where they will never recover and come back. So it's sad. So in that particular place, they're not going to be there any longer. I worry about, I talked to some folks in our state department of health and other people. I worry with this virus. So the vaccine is one thing and maybe treatments are another thing and resource management but those folks around the world who are already marginalized, you know, are they going to be, they'll be further marginalized. And how can we in the future, young adults now, we're all very conscious about other people and uh, lifting each other up and taking care of each other should be our most important thing as humans, but we don't always go there. Right. And how can we make sure that these already marginalized folks are getting access to the resources that the rest of us have access to eventually. But um, so, so that's a geography conundrum and a human conundrum that I don't know how, how to come up with that solution because you involve people, right? I'll go on. Did that answer your question a little bit, Steve? I got it, way off. Yeah, oh yes, definitely. <laughs> Well, I think that's a that's also just an excellent beginning about um, geographical information systems and what they are and and it's just it's uh, there's no limit to the amount of information that they encompass and the problems that they can help solve and so right. it's, it's excellent but it's like oh my gosh how overwhelming so, it is. thank absolutely. God we have these smart kids and now look look how much we've all come together as a society around the world, I'm working on possible vaccines and solutions for this virus. And I think I choose to be more positive. I think that's quite amazing that we've got smart people all over really massively conducting research at, at lightning speeds and uh, managing all of that information and that data. It's quite something. Uh, I, um, for the young adults, I have two of those myself and they're very concerned about humanity. Um, I, I know a lot of the university and high school folks and in their twenties, and I'm excited that they are worried because I'm hoping that, you know, they can make some changes that are more kind and not that you and we aren't worried, but um, anyway, so the story map part, I do you care if I start, I have a little tiny PowerPoint yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. It's flat. I'm not going to do, and I'll go through it fairly quickly. Well, you're pulling that up. I, I have a question for you. Yeah. Is there such thing as a geographer anymore? It seems like 20 years ago, uh, when we taught geography in school, it was a small unit part of social studies. That was geography. But it right. seems like now there's not a field that's not using this. It, right. Every single field has to use some sort of GIS. It's using these information database systems overlaid. It's all geospatial related, tied in. And I can't think of a single field that it's not being used and integrated into. Has the rest of science and engineering, uh, have they taken in geography and now it, it's not its own thing necessarily, but it's all part of something now? Yes. And, and so pros and cons, right? It's like history. History we know is temporal over time and geography is spatial. So over a certain amount, spatial realities. And a lot of folks are using that, yes, from all kinds of disciplines. Imagine all the data people are gathering. And a lot of that data is managed under that GIS, that geographic information systems, or the method of looking at things. 
So whether you're doing archaeology or anthropology or sociology, uh, a lot of the medical research for uh, doctors and hospitals, they manage all of that data under that GIS, that software, so that they can look at it from different perspectives and they massage the data or they say, we need more data. We need this particular kind of data. And then they bring it all together and hopefully that helps them answer those questions. Um, sometimes look at the, like algae uh, on the water, the reservoirs that feed Indianapolis, Indiana. And sometimes depending on, there's a certain temperature and humidity and in the summer, sometimes the algae has a little growth and it affects the smell of our water. And people every year get really upset over that. But um, the folks, they've been working on this and gathering the information and they're using drones to take some imagery and find some of these blooms to hopefully identify what's happening in that little microclimate and try to help resolve that problem. It's not a safety factor for the water, but um, you know, it, it bothers people to turn on their tap and have water that smells funky. So, <laughs> I'll keep it like this, just so I don't talk too long on this, but a story map is a way to tell a story. There is software available for free to use from uh, a, an entity called ESRI, E-S-R-I, and you can find them on the internet, and we'll talk a little bit about this. This is a story map that uh, Jeannie, my organization, started about civil rights locations in Indiana. And this is a very basic story map. You can see um, a little bit of a map of Indiana with some pins on it. And then a, a picture, and that's our uh, Landmark for Peace Memorial for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy when uh, Mr. Kennedy was speaking in Indianapolis. And then within that story map, you can go on and create each one of those pins on that map have a picture and a little identifier. So that's a very basic story map. I'll go on to my next image. There. What is a story map? Uh, jo Dr. Joseph Kursky, who is employed at ESRI, he is the man, and he'll be embarrassed that I said that, but for anything to do really with GIS or geospatial technologies, he's an amazing individual. And he likes to say that story maps are a simple web app that combine interactive ways, maps and multimedia, and experiences to tell stories by the user. I look at story maps as a way to combine, um, say maps and graphs, bar, bar graphs, pie charts, books, interviews, video, uh, your own photography or photography you've borrowed from someone else and data, all kinds of data. So all of that when we use the term data, we mean all of that information. So it's not only, you know, that we have, um, say I have five apples in my bowl in my kitchen. So it's data is more than just numbers. We actually, there are several story maps. If you type in story maps in Indiana, we have some amazing things. One, uh, you can see in the front geomorphology field trip in Northwest Indiana which is an amazing part of our state because of the, the massive dunes and uh, along the Southern shore of Lake Michigan. The image up at where, where there's a big tunnel, that's our big dig in Indy. It's one of the biggest dig, underground digs in ever. And uh, it's a way to store our storm water and keep it separate from our sewer water and not have everything dump into the White River. And, You'll see the Hunan Marketplace down in the central part. Uh, that's an image and somebody created a story map about the current virus situation. The Australian bushfire story map. I mean, there's just story maps about everything. And students and teachers and whoever can get on the internet and make a map. In order to do that, you need to sign up for uh, either, let me see if I can move my screen a little bit. For schools, ESRI has offered free membership for school, any school or any entity, uh, boys and girls clubs, 4-H, who are doing outreach for K through 12 students. And I always even say future teachers, so hitting the post-secondary environment. 
And if anyone's doing a little bit of research or helping a school kind of upscale their technology and use of technology, uh, for individuals, you can go in and register and it's a public account, but everything you do on that account is private unless you choose to make your things public. And then for a school bundle, and I'll go through these websites very quickly also. The individual, and that's, that's so if it, uh, anyone can sign up for that. Yes. So if I wanted to, let's say I was uh, mapping the, the Smith uh, lineage where people were buried and doing the genealogy behind that, I could actually make one on my own, totally not related to school stuff. Right. I could just go on and do that, right? Right. And you can have a free access and they don't, they don't send you a lot of junk. Um, you know, about everything and anything. Again, this is one of the world's leaders in GIS or data, latitude and longitude data gathering. And again, data means uh, satellite imagery, all that beautiful photography we see, uh, aerial imagery. It could mean interviews, um, articles. So all of that is considered data nowadays. But um, a lot of that has a mapping component. So yes, you can get a free account. And for schools, you can sign up for a free school bundle. And within that school bundle, if a teacher wanted to have, say, 200 or 500 sub-accounts for every student, you can request that and they will grant that to you. Then you use those online. So it's stored in the Esri cloud and you don't have to utilize the uh, resources and the technology uh, capacity for your particular school or school corporation. So it's a good tool. It's a great resource they have. It's a phenomenal way to do at home. And when we're all stuck home with uh, hybrid education or, you know, everybody's quarantined for two weeks, there's no reason why students can't be utilizing this technology. Next page. Uh, there are traditional story maps and we, we can, I'll post this PowerPoint, Steve, and send you the links so then people okay. can look at it if they want to. Perfect. There are the story maps 1.0, the very first version, and there are different formats. I'm, I'm inclined to do the basic because it's literally the pins on the map with the photo and the description, or you could tie in a video and, or interviews or do your own field work. And so there's a link there. And then Story Maps 2.0, which really you, and I'll show you that you start running the thing and it says build and you click and you start to build your own story map. And last year, the three of us did a presentation at the state science teacher conference. And uh, in that crowd, two people started and created a basic story map yeah. while during our what 30 minute presentation. Mm -hmm. So it cracked me up. Here is, so we have, as a result, um, from all these story maps, different schools ha can participate in a national competition, middle school and high school students, and it's a map competition. And the deadline is in May, and for Indiana's registered, and so we have 10 $100 Amazon gift cards as prizes. And I've got a link here for the 2019 winners and the 2020 winners. And then there's um, some details. We've had, we had somebody do buzzing bees. So bees, how the value of bees. Of course, the automotive industry in Indiana was big back in the day. And somebody had done a story map on the automotive industry. Bats are little brown bats in Indiana. And uh, other topics that uh, like elected officials from Indiana and that, that are appropriate. So you can kind of see what some of the kids are doing. These are again, very basic story maps because they're not necessarily professionals working on that. But um, on the Esri website, you can find story maps about almost anything that people from all around the world are creating. And again, those are from professionals, but they're amazing. And we have different, uh, I like tying in images of students doing field work and different professional development uh, different student opportunities between the three of us or other outreach groups that we all work with. We're very fortunate in Indiana. Uh, National Geographic Society has some really good resources and information on geo inquiry. And we'll, uh, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. I'm going to show you a website. And they do have a, 
uh, educator certification. So any educator, parent who does homeschool, boy, anybody who does education outreach can sign up to become a certified educator at the National Geographic. And it allows you to access their resources more, especially their explorers from all over the world and lots of lessons and to interact with uh, educators from all over the world. It's a really good way to, to network with uh, like-minded colleagues. I've put up a huge page, some of my favorite geospatial technology resources. And uh, I'll post, you know, this will be part of the PowerPoint, but if folks want to link to those there, and there's some amazing resources that are so cool that people don't know about and books, children's literature books, picture books, there's some cool stuff out there. So I want to say thank you. And if anybody needs to um, ask me questions, I mean, you can certainly talk to Steve and Sarah and, but, uh, and they'll post how to contact me later. So I'm gonna cancel that and unshare, stop sharing my screen. And then I'm gonna start sharing something else. Is that all right, Steve? I can go yeah. to a few websites, do I have time? Sure. And Kathy, I just love the idea that, you know, we have these, like you said, the longitude and latitude data, but then on top of that with these story maps that not only do you get the data points collected at those locations, but then you get to add in the pictures and the videos and also, and I feel like, especially for students learning today, I think that is so important that it just really makes, it's not just numbers on a page that they're analyzing, but it's that whole piece that they see how, why those numbers were collected and how, like it just, the story maps kind of do all of that, right? Make it right. relevant. Right. Um, can you see the screen? It says schools mapping software bundle. Uh, no, it says Google. Google. Okay, stop. Let me try to see here. Well, you're well. She's pulling that up, Sarah. What I want to see is someone to do a story map on all the street art in Indiana. There's so many murals and stuff like that. Yeah. Are so pretty. I know some of the augmented reality games I play has a lot of those murals, and I love seeing those pop up. I, I, cool. I, I would like to see a story map done on that. So, if someone does that. Give me a shout out. We'll share it. <laughs> we'll have you on the show. <laughs> now, can you see my screen now? What kind of story do you want to tell? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So when you, if you are on the computer and you click in S3 comma story maps, you'll come up with a zillion choices. It get too, can, there's so much information. It's very confusing. But um, this is their basic, I call the, the, in the dummy, the story maps light for people like myself. So you can jump right in and click create story, or you can look to see um, what kinds of format are you looking at. So this uh, sequence of place enabled photos or videos, that's a basic story map. It's a great place to start. And literally you can just click the build button and start building. The uh, students will have to know where they're going to have like photos, what kinds of photos, and you can decide what you want to do with that later. It does require a little bit of research and upfront work, which most of the kids are more than capable in middle school and high school nowadays of doing that. Um, here's my login, and uh, you can see that I've, uh, you, once you create your own login, either public or with a school, You'll log in to Story Maps and Esri, and then you get a page like this. And I only have two Story Maps that I've really worked on, and but some people have, you know, 50. So then all of those will have images on their landing page, uh, and that's very handy because then you can get in and edit and change and redo photos and add to the Story Map and enrich it. And again, it's private unless until you choose to make it publicly available for everyone. So, or for students, they could have it so that other students, their colleagues can see it or their teacher. And that's a really pretty, pretty thing. Here's the starting place. So I like doing this. And when you first start, it's new stories. And this is a tutorial. This page is a tutorial. And again, I have these links on that PowerPoint. And the tutorial for people like myself 
literally I have to have this on one screen and then I'm on the other screen. Even though I've done this a few times, uh, when I'm doing a story map, I still get discombobulated and I have to follow the directions. So here's your sign in and then start your story. And I'll just go through this really quick. And here's somebody else's landing page. You see it looked a little bit like mine, but they have quite a few story maps already up on their uh, landing page. And it literally says, what do you want it to look like? What do you want to add in here? What do you want the title to be? Build your narrative. And they, you don't have to have imagery, captions, moving stuff around. I mean, this tutorial I think is extremely well done. Making a map, there are, so you can make a map while you're building your story map. And they give you internal map options that you can choose from. Uh, so you don't have to go out and create a map somewhere else and save it and then figure out how to import it into this story map. You can do a story map right there. And for beginners, this is the best, I think the best tool to use for that. And so they've got all kinds of directions and everything. It's, they've just done a great job of explaining to you, to me, how to do this. And it's open-ended, right? Like you could do yep. any kind of data for collecting these, as long as it's place-based. Correct, right, right. But like I said, that large umbrella of data, and this is in the national and state academic standards, data isn't only numbers anymore or the location, latitude and longitude. Data could be an interview. Data could be um, a historic written document. Data could be satellite imagery. So there's a lot more to data in the 21st century than simply numbers or latitude and longitude long. Uh, intersecting points. And I wanted to show you also, did I do the uh, bundle? Let me get that going here. Story maps, maps, bundle, 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 map, bundle. This is where if you're a teacher, Bundle schools. Let me try there. If you are a teacher and you decide, hey, I want to try this for my school, and literally, and then you have, there's amazing people at the Esri site who just do K-12 outreach, and you can call them and have a video chat. Um, so you're getting to the school mapping software bundle, and you scroll down and then request a free ArcGIS for Schools bundle and you fill out this information and then you hit submit. And it takes, you know, I don't know, two to four days and you'll hear from somebody, uh, hey, we're giving you a hundred, you know, or 200, whatever you ask for, or 20. You may just wanna have an AP, your AP uh, human geography kids have access to do some uh, development and data. So that's pretty easy to do. Once you get that though, I firmly recommend so the teacher sort of has an idea of where they want to go. Let the students figure it out because they're quicker than a lot of us in these things. And, and then they can teach you how to use a story map. I think, and also another thing that Esri has done with some of all that data that has been collected, they've created geo inquiries, which I love. And, the, um, and they're based on themes. So you can see some American literature, earth science, environmental science, government, human geography, math. I won't read all those, but you can go into a category and let's say we'll go into upper elementary and click in. And there are a list of a lot of different geo inquiries and geo inquiries are usually two to three page interactive activities that involve some uh, story map and some mapping elements as well as other things. And it's a great way again of doing at home education when you're hybrid or if you're a homeschool family. If you have boys and girls club uh, 4-H kids after school FFA and you're doing some uh, soil studies, things like that. These inquiries, this uh, can be done in, in the classroom or on a device at home. So you can see under 
the upper elementary, all these different topics. And I love these. And uh, again, and, uh, American literature hits the board. Think about all the books that schools require the students to read. And think about the spatial nature of, of those books. And the kids could take a book or a team of kids could take a book that they really like uh, to Kill a Mockingbird or whatever and create a story map using that book and just researching and finding some more information about the times, the author, uh, what was hap what else was happening around the world when that book was written. So I, um, it's a great tool to use wandering your neighborhood. If you're taking walks, identifying things. Uh, so the geo inquiries are a great resource and the National Geographic also has a geo inquiry training um, course, set of courses for teachers you can do on your own time and there, it's a good way, again, of networking and accessing the Nat Geo resources. It's a great theory. I call it the, it's like the scientific method for spatial thinking and geographic perspectives. So Geo Inquiry is an awesome uh, resource and tool. It's a, a framework under which you can teach, just like the scientific method. Another resource I love is called iNaturalist. And can you see that? Yeah. The little stork. Yeah. And it's an app on your phone, you can let, register online and get an account as a teacher, I do that. And then I have an app on my phone and it's a little green bird and, uh, and the students can take walks and do whatever they want to do or hikes or around the school and take some photos with their device. Those get uploaded and the teacher or different student groups or a student individually can make use that data. So this is a GIS, a real live uh, citizen science and per, you know academic scientists all over the planet are loading information. So for instance, when I look out and I see a pileated woodpecker in my backyard destroying my old my kids' old fort in the wood because there must be crit little bugs in there, mm -hmm. I took a picture and there were two of them eating that fort. And I took pictures and I loaded it up to the iNaturalist website. And uh, it has identifying mechanisms. So if you don't know that that's a pileated woodpecker, then you can figure out what it's called. And scientists every day from all over the planet are watching what data is being uploaded and either correcting or enhancing or enriching your information. So for me, this is a great tool. Anybody can use it. Uh, you can do it in your backyard, on natural hikes, or whatever. Uh, another resource that I love is Indiana View, and it's housed at Purdue University. But if you come down and you see Landsat images for all Indiana counties, so the United States Geological Survey, um, part of their space network, they take pictures of the Earth all over the Earth uh, constantly, and we have a collection for every county in Indiana, a gentleman and his uh, students there at Purdue put together the images from all over and for each county. And it's great to study change in place over time. So we can just look really quickly at Tippecanoe County and you can see one image. The L5 is Landsat 5, which was a particular satellite from 1986, April 12th. And then if you scroll down, the latest image in this collection is a Landsat 8, which is the latest satellite. It's from 2015, August 2nd. And I love to look at these seasonal comparisons. Sometimes um, you can see this Landsat. This is from April of 2015, late April. And then compare it to April of 1986. Look at that, the land use change. And you can zoom in one factor really, or zoom back out. But looking at change in place over time, I love doing that. We have an amazing resource, our state GIS, our geospatial folks. We have a great network, not, not every state, most states don't even actually share data and information, but we all work together and share uh, information so we can make better decisions for the whole state. And you can come in and view the map. And this is again, a free resource 
for every single county, there's roughly 270 to 300 layers of data. So we talked about layers earlier mm -hmm. and students can come in or teachers can come in and you can add information, demographics, environment, geology. You can see the different categories, imagery. I love the hydrology. So if we can scroll up and why don't we, um, let's do water bodies, lakes or local reservoirs. And you can see when you zoom into the map, different reservoirs. Let's do streams and I'll do rivers. Look at that. And then you can close this if you want. But look at our state. Who knew we had that much surface water? Again, you can zoom in and zoom back out. And then you can add uh, human factors if you want. So demographics, where are some of the, um, I like to do uh, population for children in poverty, you know, and so then you can, and then you can massage the opacity of different layers of maps, the intensity of the colors. There's a lot of different tools and this is a true uh, GIS. This is, the tools that we use now to solve problems and plan for the future. So each of these are awesome resources and we'll make sure we have the links to the resources both in the in the description and uh, then a link to the PowerPoint we'll have in there too right. so that uh, people can check these out because they can be really used across the board for people in so many different ways yeah. and uh, it it's just amazing. We appreciate you uh, bringing these and showing these to us. And we appreciate did I answer your all time. your questions? We okay. did. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Kathy. Thank you. You guys be well.